Hi, and welcome to Salem Covenant Church. My name is Nick, and I am the communication specialist slash custodian here at Salem. Thanks for coming and checking out our church today. We really appreciate it. Let me give you a quick snapshot of what we're all about here at Salem. We want to help you encounter God, equip people, and extend the gospel. We want to be a vibrant community of Christ followers who draws this current generation into an encounter with Jesus Christ and equip all within that community to share his love and truth with others. If you're a member here at Salem, have been coming for a little while or here for the first time, and you want more information about this church, please go to our website at salemcovenant.org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. So for weekly content, encouragements, a few laughs, please follow us there. The best way to stay connected with us here at Salem and grow in your walk with Jesus is to join a small group. And small groups are just groups of people who meet regularly together uh, for community, encouragement, and accountability. So if you're interested in joining a small group, please go to salemcovenant.org slash smallgroups to check out the options available. Everything that we do here is only possible by your support. So thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity. We have three ways to give here at Salem. One is the physical way. It's the offering box that's just outside of the sanctuary doors. The second option is going to our website and clicking on the big Give to Salem button and you'll be taken to our online giving form. And the third way, of course, is downloading the Church Center app. As we continue to grow as a church, we've made it possible to watch live the sermon from the Coffee Area TV. If there's no room left in the sanctuary or you just need a little bit of space, it's a wonderful option to go watch out there. And the coffee area is just right outside the sanctuary doors and to the right. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Please take the time to get connected with us. Following Jesus is so much easier within community and we'll help you get equipped so that together we can extend Jesus' love to the world. All right, grab your Bible, lean forward and join us. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. It's so nice to see everyone here this morning. Welcome to everybody, all our new visitors, and um, also everybody online. Um, we're so excited to worship with you this morning. Can I hear an amen? Are you excited this morning? <laughs> um, so our volunteer of the week um, is Clay Armstrong. We are celebrating him this week. Can we get a round of applause? Um, we're just so thankful for Clay. Um, he has been our summer intern. Um, he's also volunteering um, on Sundays on worship team. And then also he co-leads um, a small group on Thursdays and then also helps out on a Wednesday at Remedy. That's a lot. Thank you, Clay. We're so thankful for you. <laughs> this morning, I would like to share a small scripture with you. Um, Psalm 119, 105 reads as follows. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light on my path. I want to encourage each and every one of you today to keep your eyes on Jesus and to remain in him and the word. He never leads, leaves us and never forsakes us. Um, please join us for coffee after the service and now for the announcement video. Thank you. Hey, my name is Nick and... I'm Allison. And in case you missed it, here's a recap of what's happening here at Salem. Saturday, November 13th, Covenant Park Bible Camp is hosting a whole evening of fun and food. It's the annual fall fundraiser. Theater for the Thirsty will be performing This Is My Story. There will be dinner and a silent auction. All proceeds will go to the renovations at camp. Next Sunday, bring in your Operation Christmas Child boxes. November 23rd at 6 p.m., Salem will be hosting a special Thanksgiving service. We'll be singing hymns, 
Stephen will be sharing a message, and of course, afterwards we'll be having some sweet snacks and coffee. There will be no Wednesday night activities on November 24th. Big, Big sale, sale next, next week. week! Now I'd like to take a moment to highlight just a few things. The first thing we'd like to highlight are small groups. Now there's still plenty of time and plenty of space for you to join, and a lot of the groups are happening on Tuesday nights or Thursday nights. For more information, you can go outside our sanctuary doors to the small group wall, go online or download the Church Center app, or just contact Kelsey Baker. She is our small group coordinator and she'd be happy to get you plugged in. Now, doing life together is so much easier than doing it separate. So if you're not a part of a small group yet, please, I really, really encourage you to find a way uh, to get plugged in. A couple of the groups are Jim Johnson is leading a group through the basics of the Christian walk, and then Kendall and Jesse Degerstrom and John Strunk are leading two separate groups through the book of Hebrews. The other thing we want to highlight is Wednesday night activities. We have something for everyone. Starting at 5.15, we have our community dinner. Starting at 6, we have the activities anchored for the little kids, nursery for the really little kids, remedy for our youth, and an adult service. There's room for you to join us. Mark your calendars for Salem's first family winter retreat at Covenant Park Bible Camp in the Winter Lodge. It'll be February 25th through the 27th. Broom ball, saunas, polar plunge, snowshoeing, bring your own equipment for ice fishing, Nordic skiing, snowmobiling. Do I need to say anything else? November 28th is the start of Advent and Salem's second service. We'll be having a service at 9 and 1045 with coffee at 10 a.m. in between services. If you need any more information on these events, go to salemcovenant.org slash events. See you next week. Next Sunday, bring in your Operation Christmas Child boxes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. All right. My beat stopped. Sorry. Community, community dinner. Dinner. Community. Yeah, community dinner. Dinner. I didn't press the record button after I stopped it last time, so we have to do that first part over again. Luckily, it was just the first part. Right? Because then it'll be like that, that motion of up and then down. <gasps> like, and then, Ooh. yeah, that's for a different video. Different video. That sounds cool, though. Nick, why do you got to be on your phone for such a long time? Well, how about just back off, Allison? <laughs> well, we're going to worship together. Why don't you join us as we lift up the name of Jesus? Come on. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing by night Alive. All my failures I've tried to hide. It was my dream till I met you. Thank you, Jesus. You call my name. Oh
your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name. Come on, let's hear it. I need it. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan. But you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open, cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you call my name. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise. Thank you, Jesus. Grace of God, He made the chains that hold me 
Jesus, Holy Jesus, united we will sing, united by the love of Jesus, Holy Jesus.
Father God, what a, what a morning to just be in your presence amongst your people. Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to, to come together, to be in unity, to worship you, to lift up your wonderful name. Because there's no other name like the name of Jesus. And that we get to celebrate again your life, your death and the resurrection and the hope that we have in you this morning and lord i pray this morning that that hope will be alive in our hearts this morning as we celebrate your table and as we listen to your word lord i pray that we will be so encouraged that we will be set free that we will um, be delivered uh, that we will be rejoicing all the way home this morning may you you receive all of the glory all of the honor in jesus name amen and amen you may be seated again good morning to all of you that's uh, with us this morning in the church building and welcome to all of you that is joining us online we we so appreciate uh, your time and for all of us to just be united and um you know we definitely uh, think of all of the hunters this morning i i've heard a lot of complaints already that uh because of the weather i guess they need snow and cold weather for some reason to be a effective hunter uh, i don't understand all of that uh, i just will tell them as a south african deal with that this is my type of winter so um i guess if they don't get any deer they can blame it on me um, it is such a joy for us again to come to the Lord's table this morning. And maybe if you're new to church or, um, uh, you know, just communion table, wondering what this is all about, why do we celebrate communion at least at Salem once a month? And usually we celebrate communion the first Sunday of the month. Um, this is very special to us. Um, it reminds us of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why we want to take, uh, you know, every first Sunday of the month, the reality is we can probably take every Sunday to um, celebrate and just to be reminded again of um, 
God's love for us by giving his son, Jesus Christ. So when it comes to communion, we are reminded that we are in communion with God. And, but we're also reminded that we're co in communion with each other, right? We're in unity. That's that beautiful song that our worship team wrote that we were singing this morning, that it is the Lord's heart that we are united as they are united as the Trinity. And um, it is always such a, a powerful image for me when I think about Communion Sunday and to be reminded that communion is happening all over the world uh, as the body of Christ and that we have this one thing, this one image, the death and life and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we all celebrate either in small town, the Louvre, West the Louvre, or if it's in South Africa, Australia. Um, and also this morning, we'll be using this cup that is from Haiti and to be reminded of the church in Haiti and our missionaries in Haiti. And this all week, I was thinking about all those missionaries. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but the media is very quiet about those uh, 17 missionaries. And so we've been, as a family, we've been praying for them. I just think about all those kids, you know, this is now weeks being in, um, you know, I don't know what all of the circumstances. We were in pretty good circumstances in Haiti and it was still hard. And so then when you're being kidnapped. So even uh, this morning as we come to the Lord's table, I wanna encourage you to pray for those that are still in Haiti that's being kidnapped and we pray for a miracle and um, that they will be able to come home soon. Um, just as a reminder again this morning that um, uh, when it comes to the Lord's table, we celebrate open table here at Salem Covenant Church or with the covenant. That means that you do not need to be a member, um, but we do ask that uh, you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your savior. And then again, also just a reminder that um, after the service during communion Sunday, we will have one of our ushers will have an exit offering uh, by the door. And that just go towards some of the local needs within our congregation. So if you can help us with that, we will greatly appreciate it. The Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took a uh, took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread uh, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes again. Let us take a moment to just prepare our heart and our mind as we come to the Lord's table. Lord Jesus, to you be the praise and honor for giving yourself, shedding your blood, and letting your body be broken in death for our sake, so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Bless, O God, this bread which we together eat and the cup which we together drink. Let us through this blessed bread and blessed cup become partakers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for us.
This cup is the new covenant that we have in the blood of Jesus Christ. Drink of it. Will you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are busy in the book of Hebrews. We um, will be working a little bit through Hebrews 11 today. Uh, we'll probably spend most of our time verse 1 to verse 3. And um, I might even leave you a little frustrated today. And um, because I want you to go home and do a little bit more research and to work through this chapter because like most of Hebrews, it is um, so rich. And um, I probably need four or five weeks to just work through Hebrews 11. There's so much um, in this chapter. And so I hope you will go that you will feel like, oh man, it's like a, a cliffhanger. He just, he gave me just a, a little bit and that's good. Now go home and go and study it um, on your own. Now, as we look at Hebrews 11, um, I want you to know that this is the longest chapter in this book. Um, and I am so impressed just working through the book of Hebrews. Back growing up in South Africa, Friday night was kind of the night where all of the cool shows played. You know, as I said, as growing up as a kid, we used to go every Friday night to my grandmother's um, house or apartment, and we would, she would have candy in the fridge we immediately ran to the fridge grabbed candy and then we were playing games and then depending on where we're at and what season on a friday night it was usually either so friday nights were macgyver the old version <laughs> okay um then it was airwolf and then it was yeah some of you now i'm really dead i was like man we didn't realize you're that old steven yeah, um, and then one of my favorites, the A-Team, again, old version A-Team, and um, the, the leader of the A-Team had a saying, you remember what he's saying? I love it when a plan comes together. Now, when I look at Hebrews, wow, I love it how everything is coming together together. I mean, it is just brilliant how the author was writing this book. There is so much and how it's flowing and how it's connecting and how it's pointing us to the Old Testament. And then again, how the Old Testament is coming to life when we look at the New Testament. It is just incredible. And so again, I want to encourage you buy a commentary, go online, study it, you will be blessed if you're going to really take some time to just really understand this passage. Now, um, when we look at Hebrews chapter 1 to chapter 10, and I said there's kind of a little bit of a switch in verse 19, but when you look at Hebrews 1 to 10, um, the author is painting a picture for us of Jesus. Now, that's exactly how Jesus looked, right? Can I hear me? 
because we have a photo of him. No. Thank you, Teresa, for doing that. We will sell that for $200,000 afterwards. Okay. Um, and that's based off the chosen Jesus. Thank you for doing that. That is incredible. I might have been able to pull off the Hebrews 1 to 10. But so Hebrews 1 to 10, the author does an incredible job giving us a picture of Jesus. And in the way that he's doing that is by reminding us that Jesus, you remember the three words that we've been looking throughout so far? Superior, bigger, and better, right? A greater. And so he's been telling us, giving us this image of like Jesus is greater, more uh, superior than Moses, than the law, than the high priest. And so we kind of have this image of Jesus. Then in verse 20 or verse 19 in chapter 10, there's a switch. There's a word of encouragement to the believers. And now we see that encouragement again happening in Hebrews 11. But there's something really important that is happening in this chapter. And we all love this chapter. I mean, it is such a famous chapter, chapter 11. Now, um, what is happening in chapter 11? It will help us to say, okay, we have an image of Jesus, 1 to 10. Okay, cool, we see that. Great job. Now I know Jesus is bigger, greater than all of these other things. But for me as a person living in America, and I'm sure even for that early audience, those Hebrew believers, then to say, okay, how do I relate to Jesus? I have all of this information. That's a great question, right? Sometimes I, I think it's a valid question for us as believers to ask, how do I relate to Jesus? When we think about the Trinity and you have God, you have Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but it's like, okay, What's that application piece? How do, I, how do I start that relationship with Jesus? And that is what we're going to see in chapter 11. It is, if you want to write down next to chapter 11 there, make a note for yourself to say, this is how I relate. This is how I relate, relate with Jesus. And here it is. By what? Okay, say it like you're excited to be here this morning. By? By faith, right? And that's the whole topic. It's about by faith. And it, man, it is, it is such an exciting topic. You're going to be just challenged in your faith this morning as we look at this definition of faith. But first, I want to just show you, again, um, in, it, when it comes to realty, we always say location, 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 right? We, we all know that. When it comes to interpreting God's word with hermeneutics and stuff, we'll say, we'll say context, 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 and cotex, cotex, cotex. Those are really important things that we need to apply when it comes to interpreting God's word. And so I want to just show you kind of how chapter 10 is linking to 11, and then you're even going to see how 12 or how 11 is linking to 12, and how 12 is referring back to 11, and because it's just going to it's it's building up. We have a build up here around this topic on how do I relate to Jesus? How do I relate to Jesus by? Okay, stay awake. Otherwise, I'm going to ask Kathy to bring in stronger coffee. No decaf for you guys today. All right. So go to Hebrews chapter 10. And look at verse 38. But my righteousness, one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. He's referring back to the Old Testament, right? And so... He's linking us, he's kind of giving us a clue to what is happening in Hebrews 11. So he says, my righteous ones will live by, okay, as believers, how are we supposed to live? 
by faith. That's how we relate to towards Jesus, all right? So kind of keep that in mind. That's one of the links and that bridge that we have to 11. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 12 as a great way to start that chapter. It says, therefore, you remember how many times do we see that word in Hebrews? All the time, right? He's constantly li linking different ideas. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, he's using this word, therefore, to do what? To link us back to 11. And then since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who's he talking about? All of those believers and faith giants in 11. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful how he's linking with the same idea, giving us this core message of our faith and how important that is. Now, I'm having a hard time here just trying to stay with my notes because I know once I get off preaching here, we're going to be in trouble. And I don't want to preach this morning. I want to give you the overall idea of this chapter so that you can go in and study it. Now, as we think about this word faith, because when, if we're honest, it's not um, a common term in, I'll say, the secular world. We understand it within the church, right? I mean, as a word that you've, you, if you, if you've been in the church world for a long time, I mean, it's probably not a Sunday where you have not heard that that word or that term. And so, in a sense, you know what that means. But let me just test you. If I take you right now, I know Jeff is really smart. If I take Jeff and I put him on the stage and say, give you the mic, say, Jeff without giving us a description of, uh, of faith, and you can't use Hebrews 11, explain to us faith. Who's ready to do that? Who's ready to go for another cup of coffee? Okay. So if we're honest, I mean, again, we're so used to that word, and we have a sense of what it means, but actually, when we think about it, it is not an easy word to explain. Do you agree? I mean, just, just think about it. If you suddenly you're in a situation, now you explain faith. What will you communicate? What is true biblical faith? So let me share with you what it is not. Faith is not positive thinking. It's easy to fall into this trap to just think, oh, if I just think positively, that's going to be faith. It is not. Faith is not a hunch. Sometimes we'll say that. Well, I have a hunch. Well, that's not faith. Okay, you just had bad pizza last night. <laughs> faith is not hoping for the best, hoping that everything will turn out all right. And then faith is not a feeling of optimism. And so when we look at all of these things, and again, we're looking for a biblical definition of biblical faith. Because if we can grasp that, we're going to have a healthy biblical way to relate with Jesus Christ. Okay, so now we know what faith is not. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, and it's going to give us a clear Definition, I use definition loosely here um, on what faith is. And I want you to highlight, I want you to make notes, um, because this is such a key passage for us as believers. All right, we need to get this right. And, and the reality is so many people in the church, so many believers, I don't think that we have a good biblical understanding of what faith is based on Hebrews 11. So let's just read through verse one, two, three. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for 
and an assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients, I don't like that word, some other translations talk elders, you can maybe put elders, we'll get back to that, were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now, again, when you look at theological studies, there's kind of a, uh, a term, we'll just, uh, easy thing for you to, re to recall back, kind of the parallel lines, that's what we see in verse 1. There's these parallel tr uh, truths. Um, two different ways of saying the same thing. So in verse 1, when you look at that, you're going to see there's kind of two different statements. They pretty much say the same thing. It's just building one truth on another. And it kind of, it builds up. It's like, okay, here's one truth about faith. And boy, now we're going to take it to another level. Here's the same kind of truth, but we're just building it on each other. So stay with me. I know we're, we're doing some theology here this morning. But this is key. All right. Let's look at that verse again. We'll break it down a little bit here. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You see that? There's the, the parallels, all right? Now, again, um, we can look at that statement and say, okay, well, cool. Here's the definition of faith. I got it. When you just look at that, who... Who's got the revelation of faith is? I can send you home right now and you're going to know, okay, I now know exactly what to do, what faith is. Right? You got to chew a little bit on these words. Now, what makes it a little bit more difficult, obviously we know that Hebrews was written in what language? In Greek, right? And so um, from Greek, you have different translations, so that can sometimes mess with us a little bit when we look at the different translations because there's different ways that they are explaining this verse for us. And sometimes it can feel like two different or several different ideas. But I want you to know in all of these translations, because it was written in Greek, there is core words, kind of foundational words, and everything was kind of based off those foundational words words all right so even though you maybe have different ideas of different ways that people are translating it i want you to know that we kind of need to go back to the greek to have that that base that we're working from so when you look at being sure that's from the niv the older niv not the new niv translation being sure okay um don't worry about the greek because you're going to forget that by lunchtime here's what i want you to know it talks about Firm, confidence, and guarantee. So in a sense, when you try and summarize it, it's a solid confidence. It's what that verse, first part is talking about, okay? So a solid confidence. A solid confidence in your spouse? No. Solid confidence in who? In God, all right? So when it's talking to us, like when we have this being sure, so faith, in a sense, is talking about having a solid confidence, having a guarantee, having a firm confidence in God. So many times when it comes to faith or when we're reading Hebrews 11 and we talk about faith, sometimes we'll put faith in faith. Does that make sense? Right? So... So many times our faith is based on our faith. We think, well, I need to have bigger faith. But when it comes to biblical faith, and we start to look at the Greek words, it pretty much it means there's a bit of a switch. It means to have a solid confidence or a firm confidence in God. That's the foundational piece of of faith okay we continue there as we look at that kind of that idea of assurance again with the greek word here's what it means a conviction that is not static a conviction that is lively and active 
So what he's trying to communicate to us is this, is that we have a solid, a firm assurance, confidence in God, and because we have this firm, solid um, confidence in God, next step in our faith piece, guess what? It is going to lead, our, we're going to have such a conviction that we can trust God that it's going to be active. What does that mean? It means that we're going to live our faith out. We're going to be doers. We're going to act based on God's word and because of what we know of God. So again, faith is not just something that's dead, right? It's something that lives and that grows inside of us. And, and I think this is true. Uh, I think I can say this. So as your confidence in God grows, guess what's going to happen? Your faith is going to grow, right? The more you can relate to Jesus as you read Scripture, as you hear testimonies, as we gather, uh, and, and again, as I said, as you hear God's Word, um, and you're going to see Him being faithful in your life, your faith is going to grow. Because your understanding of Jesus is growing. And you say, oh, God is the real deal. That this is not just some sort of blind faith. None of us should just, in a sense, come Sunday morning and say, uh, well, I believe in God. And it's some sort of blind faith. It's not going to last. It's not going to have to have a blind faith in God. You need to know why you're believing in God. Why are we believing in God? How do we know? Here's part of our assurance, is the cross. And because we have eyewitnesses, and that when it comes to apologetics, right? When we suddenly we're trying to defend the faith and we, we look at all of the facts and the crucifixion, you look at all of the eyewitnesses, all of the material that we have, guess what? Now that builds our faith. And you say, now it's not just a blind faith. It's like, hey, we can trust the cross. We can trust the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I can have faith in all of this because of all of the things that I've heard, seen over the years. We have a, a good accounts of it. So this is, in a sense, what um, the Hebrews author is trying to communicate with us. Okay, let's continue. That's why we see in James chapter 2, 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. And that's why when you look at all of these faith heroes in Hebrews 11, and again, that's why I said with the A team, love it when a plan comes together. He's building us, he's giving us faith. He's giving us a good definition here. And then he's going to give us the examples, and then he's going to say, these people trusted in me, and because they trusted in me, they acted it out. They were doing. And that's what James is trying to communicate to us, to say it's, it's good and well to say, oh, I'm full of faith, but if you're not doing anything with it, if you're not living it out, then what? Guess what? It's dead. So you need this healthy combination of both. Martin Luther gives us a kind of a great quote here. He says, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that the man who'd stake his life on it a thousand times. And so even for us today to say, man, your faith is so strong that what Jesus did on the cross for us is like, I'm willing to bet my life a thousand times on it. I'm willing to die for it because I know he's at the right hand of the Father preparing a place for me. So even if I die today, oh, death, where's your sting? I'm going to be in presence of God. And so that's a great reminder for us like, hey, don't be so afraid to die. Yes, we're going to cry about you a little bit, but man, <laughs> some of you. 
those that are watching online. <laughs> Give you another quote. Faith does not eliminate questions, but faith knows where to take them. That, that's the reality, right? So even with faith and, and this journey that we're in, so many times, yes, we still have a thousand questions. Even when we look back at these last two years, there's a lot of questions. Or when we go through hardships and some of the challenges, yes, we have questions sometimes with faith. But guess what? Where do we take those questions? We take them to God. Let's continue. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, again, we kind of have to look a bit in the Greek, but we're not going to do that. I want you to see kind of what he's trying to communicate here. If you want to experience God's favor, Who's ready to experience God's favor, okay? Um, and not just his favor, in a sense to say that God is pleasing. How do we do that? By faith. And you'll see that again later on in this passage. And then to say here, um, what, the ancients, what the ancients were commended for by God. So in a sense, we're saying, God looked at their life and the way that they were witnessing about God. How did they do that? By their actions, by the way that they were living it out. And by their actions, now guess what happened? God is saying, man, you guys are a blessing. You guys are a blessing. Great job. Awesome. Thanks for being faithful. And I believe that God is wanting to say that on our lives as well. Are we men and women that are still living out this biblical faith? Let's continue. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed so verse 3 here, sorry. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So again, many things that's going on here in this verse, kind of key ideas I want you to think about, ponder about, is this, to say that even we were not there right there in Genesis 1, right? When God was creating the universe, when he was speaking, he said, let there be light. Some of you old enough that you were there? Okay. He says, none of us were there, but we have faith that it's true, that God did it. And this is the, some of the main things that we're that we are in disagreement with the world and probably most universities because they'll say, well, it's evolution, the Big Bang Theory. But for us to go back and to say, no, 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 wait, uh, it's not evolution, but it's Genesis 1. Because God says, God's word says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That there's enough evidence and things there for me that I can say, I'm going to place my faith in God's word and not in man's crazy idea. Uh, back many years ago, there was a, a movie, and maybe you can find it online. I, I would say it is worth watching. Uh, there's a documentary. It was called, it's called Expelled. And uh, it was um, kind of a well-known actor. I think it was a friend of his that got fired from a college because he was um, teaching, at least his college was saying, you can only teach evolution. And he said, well, I think to be fair, I can't just teach evolution, at least let me give a different viewpoint as well on creation. And the college said, no, you're fired, okay? And so and then this, the director said, well, let me look into colleges. If this is just kind of a, 
uh, once-off incident or is this kind of the general idea that's happening in colleges? And so he interviewed all of these professors and there was a professor out in Texas, if I remember correctly, that he interviewed about um, evolution. And so this guy, doctorate, smart guy, and he came up with it was the most insane statement I've ever heard. He talked about that there's crystals and aliens and boom, we have the earth and people. And it's like, you're supposed, you have a doctorate, you're supposed to be one of the smartest people and you believe in crystals, aliens and boom. It's like, man, we're in trouble. We should just all move to South Africa and to the colleges there. <laughs> Don't send your kids to Texas. But they say, okay, we weren't there when God created the world, but man, we will have faith. And then I like this statement, was not made out of what was visible. When you think about that moment when God was speaking, let there be light, and he was speaking things into existence. I mean, there was nothing there, right? But as he speaks, so it's this uh, also reminder of us that there's kind of a, there's a spiritual realm, that there's so much going on in that spiritual realm that's not always visible to us in the naked eye. But it doesn't mean it's not there. And so faith then comes, and to have this faith in God then, to say, okay, God, I don't understand quite everything that's in the spiritual realm, but I'm trusting you that you can take something or you can take, make something into something out of nothing. And so and this is what he's trying to communicate. So pretty much verse one, two, three, he's just trying to establish to us what is faith. So again, then that makes sense, Second Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith and not by sight. Is this easy? No. We constantly we want to do that, right? When God is calling you into something, God is calling you into hard work, or God is calling you to have a hard conversation, and it's like, okay, let, let all of the stars align, Lord, and I need a fax, Okay, and then you get almost the facts, and it's like, okay, Lord, just send me an email. Okay, Lord, let, you know, let this and this, this happen. Uh, you know, calm all of the storms, and then I'm going to go. But that's not faith, right? And so what is communicated to us, what is biblical faith, is to say, I put my trust in God, and because I know I can trust God, because of the things that I, can, that I can go back to and refer back into the past and to scripture and to all of these stories, now it's not me putting my faith in faith, but it's me putting my faith in God. And because I know that God is faithful and because I'm his son and I'm his daughter and I can trust him, because of that, now I will go wherever. If God calls me to call Minnesota, if God calls you, I just heard somebody said, uh, what was the statement? God was calling a, a missionary. Somebody said they were so worried that God was going to send them to Africa that they were doing something, something, something. I think they were hoping to end up in Hawaii. I said that too. <laughs> so then when God calls, called us to Minnesota, I say, okay, Lord, how? This doesn't all make sense. These guys are cold and snow and frozen chosen and they don't even have rugby. But, like, but okay, God, we'll leave everything in South Africa. We'll go. We'll go. Not based on my faith, and everything that has lined or not lined up. But God, if you want us to go, I, I heard your voice because I trust you. And I know that you've never disappointed me. I'm going to go. I'm going to take that first step. 
And so a key piece to grow in your faith is to have a good understanding of who God is and to say, I really trust you. Now, when you look at this next part of Hebrews 11, kind of the image that came to mind for me, man, that's my time already. Um, sorry. I was thinking about, as he's talking about some of these, these faith heroes, the Capitol building. If you've been to Washington, D.C., and you were there in the, is it the Rotunda building, right? Is that Rotunda? Is that right? Um, in D.C., how, uh, many years ago when we were in D.C., and you, you, in, in the Capitol building there, and you see these statues of people that played an important role in American history. And it's like, I mean, it's amazing to hear the stories and everybody's role in it. I mean, it's quite a magnificent building. And so you gotta, when you look at the rest of Hebrews here, um, in a sense, imagine you're kind of in that Capitol building and instead of historic fig figures in American culture, you gotta see Moses and Sarah, Rahab, and all of these guys, and so the, these, the author is doing a magnificent job. He's pointing to these faith giants to us to stir up our faith. He's, uh, he's very intentional with the names that he's using here because he's trying to build up our faith and to say, because these guys trusted Jesus, they put their um, faith into action now they end up in chapter 11. Because I want you to know when you look at these faith heroes, none of them are superheroes. None of them. I don't see here Hulk, by faith Hulk. I don't see here by faith Captain America. Because that would be very discouraging for us, right? It's like, I can get mad. I just get red in the face. I don't turn green. Maybe I'll smash things, but I don't have a superpower. I don't turn into Spider-Man. And so you can look at these things, and even for us, we can, it's like, well, I'm never going to be Abraham. I'm never going to be Sarah. Sarah. Guess what? All of these names were normal people are people that could be sitting next to us. Okay, it'd be scary if they sit to us right next to us now. It'd be fun though too. But I mean, Sarah could be sitting here. Abraham could be sitting here. But guess what? We're part of that next generation of faith heroes. The only reason why they're in here is because they trusted God. They had a faith in God. They lived out their faith. It was not just, and then kind of that idea, when you look at, uh, just look there by verse 3, just quickly scan through the structure of 11. There's something I want you to see there, the way that he breaks that down. With each illustration, he'll say by faith. It's kind of an important Greek word there. We won't get, go into that. But it says, okay, let me show you that by faith they were motivated into action. Then he's going to give us the name of the person. He's going to um, tell us who the person is. And then very quickly he tells us the effects, the consequences, the positive consequences of them trusting God. So it says, by faith, so and so trusted me. And then they act it out. And boy, here's, here's the, the good consequences of that, or the effect of it. And so when you look at this, all of these names, again, not superheroes, all of them struggled with their faith as well, normal people, but they knew how to live out their faith. And to just kind of go back to the whole idea of reasoning, when we look at our definition, I want to show you two things. Just look at verse 11. That's the story of Sarah. 
And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she, what's that word? Considered him faithful. What does that mean? It's like, okay, Lord, I'm too old, but I'm going to look back at what you've done in the past for my family, and I'm going to consider your faithfulness, and because of your faithfulness in the past, this is going to come into fulfillment. Look, same word here. Look in uh, verse 19. Abraham reasoned, highlight, make a star there, that God couldn't even that that God could even raise the dead and so in a manner of speaking he did receive Isaac back from death so that whole idea of like Abram heard all his life I'm going to give you a massive generation right all his kids he's got Isaac and then Isaac said okay go and sacrifice your kid but then it says, Abraham considered all of the things that God has done. He said, okay, God, even if I sacrifice Isaac, I trust you enough that you're probably going to raise him then from the dead. Because you are faithful. I want you to highlight verse 6, 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. For me, growing up, kind of looking at this, sometimes it felt pretty harsh for me. Yeah, it's like, okay. How does this relate? How, does, how do I make sense of it? When you look at the main message in 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. Why? Why is he saying that? Why is the only way that you can please God is by faith? Because he talks about relationship. Right? This whole idea, this whole thing that is communicated to us to say, okay, to relate with me is by faith. Why is that faith so important? Because it shows that I am your God. That you can trust me. If you cannot trust God, then how are you going to please God? Because he, he so wants such a deep relationship, again, where that's like, man, he's my father and I'm his child. And he's got this. He's got my future and every hard aspect all of the difficult things that you're walking through yes i don't have all of these answers and some of the stuff i just don't have the picture it's not quite visible yet god i don't get it but guess what i trust you you are faithful so i'm going to live this out i'm going to walk this out so just in short this morning that is what biblical faith is. It is trusting God. Trusting Him. Realizing again this morning that He's your Father and you are His child. And He got this. It is not a blind faith. It is a faith that considers looking back at your life and say, Oh, He's been there for me. Every situation. I've got so much more, but we'll leave it there. Let's close with this reflection clip.
Come all you thirsty, come to the well and never run dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save. Thank you, Father God, for this morning that we could gather together, worship together, and give you all the glory. Lord, I thank you for the message that Pastor Stephen shared. I pray that you'll remind us in this week what it means to have faith and to put our faith in you and to put our trust in you. Lord, I pray that every situation this week will help us to grow in our trusting and our faith. Father, use everything to show us and remind us how much you love us and teach us to love each other in the same way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Sunday and go in peace. Thanks for joining us today on this online service. Let us know what you think by commenting on this video or emailing salem at salemcovenant.org. Don't forget to stay up to date with everything happening here at Salem by going to salemcovenant.org slash events. And follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook uh, for content and encouragement. So we hope to hear from you and to see you soon.